introduction. Uh, Ken is the chairman and chief executive officer of Merck and Company. He's been in that role since 2011. And uh, prior to that role, he had a first career as a, as a, as a lawyer and a partner with the Philadelphia firm of Drinkle, Biddle and Reith and uh, made that transition from general counsel all the way to chairman and CEO. He's won amazing uh, awards over the years uh, on, uh, on, uh, from the ADFL, uh, legend in leadership. And uh, under his leadership in the last decade, Merck has been uh, really become a leader in delivering innovative uh, life-saving vaccines uh, to the benefit of all of us. Um, now, over the last year, he's also chaired a startup organization called 110, which we'll talk about. So Ken, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Manny. I'm looking forward to it. And I thought I'd start with, uh, tell us about 110. Why did you start this organization? So 110 had its origins in the conversation that took place among several CEOs after the George Floyd tragedy this past summer. But it's, it's an issue that goes beyond certainly the issues that were raised in that particular instance. You know, let me give some background. You know, in, in the United States, uh, the average black family has net worth of $4,000 and the average white family has a net worth of $140,000. And a lot of that has to do with these disparities in employment that exist, uh, which ha actually have their origins in the education system and the education to employment uh, pipeline, so to speak. But one of the things that we noted is that many companies, lots of companies, have a requirement of a four-year degree for the most basic entry-level jobs in those companies. In fact, many people see the four-year degree in effect as a proxy for the hard and soft skills that are necessary to be successful in the workplace. And if you do have those kinds of four-year de degree requirements, you are unintentionally excluding 78% of African-Americans who don't have a four-year degree. And we know that the style and the way in which people acquire skills nowadays in our society is very different from it used to be, what it used to be. And so what we're trying to do is to shift the paradigm about aptitude from one that's based on you know, a four-year degree or credentials to one that's actually based on skills to give those people a meaningful pathway uh, into an opportunity to have earned success. So the goal of 110 uh, it's called 110 because we're talking about hiring 1 million Black Americans who lack a four-year college degree over 10 years into family-sustaining wage jobs, jobs that actually require a certain level of skill but don't require a four-year degree. And we're very excited that we have more than 40 companies that have put up initial capital of over $100 million to get this startup company up and running. It's, it's really exciting, Ken, and I was brought into this, by the way, uh, uh, in an early conversation back in June with one of your co-conspirators, if you will, you know, Ken Chenault, a longtime chairman of American Express and a Bain alum. Uh, the focus actually struck me. Um, there are so many issues around, around Black America race that we can all address from, and, and, and we see it. Can you get more people at the top of the funnel and boards? Can you get more people... Um, entry level, um, you were pretty narrow in the focus uh, around this sub uh, four-year college concept. And I know uh, people have, have tried to broaden that in different ways. Uh, is that part of the benefit uh, of uh, doing a startup to stay, to stay really focused as opposed to trying to solve all the challenges in, on the top? So, so we thought that a very important issue was to address this systemic barrier that the four-year college degree requirement actually posed for, again, 78% of African-Americans. So we thought if we focused on that, we could do a lot for people who right now have no pathway to earn success in our society. But we're also saying it's not just about bringing those people in. It's also about giving them career paths. And many of the companies that have joined 110 have joined because we're gonna become in effect a community of practice because as, as we look at our own workforces, we tend to see similar patterns. We hire black people who come in and they leave very quickly. They don't go through the entire process and get into senior management. So we've been to ask ourselves questions like, what are the best practices 
not only for these people who initially lack four year degrees, but also for black employees generally inside the company who want to progress to uh, positions of substantial responsibility. And so this is where uh, I, I could see the attraction and we were one of the 42 uh, companies, Ken, that you, you were able to get at the chief executive level, people who passionately wanted to join this mission, you know, uh, Nike, yeah. Walmart, AT&T. And yeah. I know there's about 500 companies that have already raised their hands for consideration and joining. The, uh, the actual value proposition to these companies, uh, how much of this was they wanted to do something good. They wanted to do something in response to the George Floyd issue versus there actually is a business opportunity and a, a need for those companies that they can solve on the talent side. Or is it, is it I both? Think, I'm saying it's, it's really both. So first of all, I think one of the most important things about this is it is a CEO led initiative. Uh, these are not just companies joining up. It's not just the chief HR officer, although they're very important. These are CEOs who are committed over a 10 year period to actually making a difference. And I think maybe the impetus was probably uh, what was happening in our country, the social unrest after the George Floyd incident, it actually brought to, to, to mind uh, the great disparities. By the way, so did the pandemic in terms of the impact on, on black Americans who are 2.7 2 times more likely to die uh, than white Americans. But I think it's also not something that's just philanthropic. It's an issue in our country, uh, before the pandemic, I saw data that said that we had almost as many non-filled jobs as we had unemployed people in this country. So companies really need to shift the paradigm if they're actually going to tap into the talent that we have in this country and be able to fill those jobs with people who may, they don't have a degree in philosophy, but they can certainly learn the skills that are necessary to do those jobs. And I just want to make one more comment about it. I mentioned earlier that based on the internet and technology, we've all changed how we've learned to do things. People, people have now gotten extremely skilled at things that were formerly sort of hobbies. And I think the tech industry was one of the first industries to embrace the skills first approach. If you look at most of the companies, they have a lot of people who, for example, are coders or work in cybersecurity or cloud security. And those people often don't have four-year degrees, but they have a set of skills. You know, coders are in high demand. And a lot of those people learn that skill in their parents' basement or garage. And we yeah. don't think of those people as lacking aptitude or desire. We simply say they have a skill that the market values and we're therefore willing to pay them even though they don't have a four-year degree. Well, I think unfortunately for many black people, particularly people who come through circumstances where they don't have access to the kind of education or the financial wherewithal to go and get a four-year degree, we just have to change our paradigm of what they're capable of. Similar to children who are raised in the inner city who often people think they're constrained by the circumstances in which they're born, but we see all these examples of charter schools and other schools that come in and, and actually say, we don't believe that. We actually believe these kids can perform well, and they do if people actually give them the wherewithal to do that. So the, uh, let's call it the conventional wisdom, maybe the orthodoxy that you need, you need a diploma from a top institution even to do, to do a, basic, a basic job and clearly, and yet, as you said, there's a lot of open job positions even, even amidst the pandemic. So from your own experience at Merck, Ken, I presume you want a job at Merck, you, you look for PhD chemists and, and, and doctors and, and you probably are yourself a prisoner of some of this conventional wisdom, at least historically. Absolutely. So has it been hard for you as a leader of your own company to say, we're gonna sign up ourselves or? Absolutely. So before 110, we had a number of people, we worked with an organization called Year Up, uh, which brings people into the workforce who've been trained, but don't have those four year degrees. We had a number of those people in our company and they were quite successful. But I think there were lots of pockets in this company for the reasons you just stated. I think we think of ourselves as a high science company. And so certainly we have a lot of PhDs and fact postdocs in the research labs who hold certain jobs, but not every job inside the company requires a PhD certainly. And 
frankly, as we looked at some of these jobs, we realized that the four-year college degree requirement was essentially a screening requirement. As I said earlier, it was a way of actually guessing whether the candidate had the necessary skills, soft skills, hard skills, aptitude, uh, et cetera, to be successful. And so we never gave people an opportunity to actually demonstrate. We didn't even have, for example, a test that they could do uh, to show that they actually had the aptitude. And it's caused us to really reflect on the systemic barriers that we're putting up there. And I would make one more point because often I'm asked, why is 110 focused on black Americans? Well, the answer is, that this is the group that's most affected or one of the groups that's most affected by the systemic barriers. But we found in many instances that if you remove those kinds of systemic barriers for one group, you actually open it up for everyone else. So as companies re-examine their job recs and their requirements for hiring, and they take away these four-year degrees requirements, that actually helps every applicant who walks in the door who doesn't have that four-year degree and my co-chair, Jenny Rometty of IBM, uh, can point to the fact that now at IBM, sort of a high-tech firm, 43% of all the jobs in the company do not require a four-year degree. And she's very proud of the fact that she just recently graduated out of that cohort of people who came in without any college, her first PhD. So it's really about seeing the potential in people and helping those people have a bridge between where they are and where they need to be in order to have a family sustaining wage and a career. Yeah, and the, uh, I, I know from the dialogues, uh, you know, Jenny's lessons at IBM and, and even some of your other uh, co-creators, uh, you know, Chuck Phillips and Kevin Scharrer and Tenshinalt all brought different perspectives. So you mentioned Europe. So on one hand, you now have this, uh, this wave of companies are willing to, uh, to, to hire, to play. And, but you also have helping this, this workforce or this potential workforce ready, get ready to, uh, to not just interview for the jobs, get the jobs, actually be, be successful, requires understanding an entirely different kind of organization that you've only been familiar with, the Europe's of the world. Mm -hmm. You know, we call it the talent ecosystem. That's, that's part of 110 too. So could, could you share, how does that work? This is, this is a matching exercise between supply and demand? Well, I think the good thing about our organization is that we start with a lot of people who are committed to make the demand side of the equation work. And on the supply side of the equation, there are a lot of organizations like Europe and many, many other companies uh, and, and, and nonprofits that do do a good job of training these people, but they tend to be subscale. And so by bringing in effect demand at scale, I think that we're also gonna be able to create a situation where we get supply at scale by credentialing these kinds of organizations and giving them the resources so that they can produce more people. I should also make the other point that these companies also have a challenge with respect to their current employees, black employees in terms of retaining those employees and promoting those employees. And so another aspect of what we're doing is not just focusing on these people who lack a four year degree, but a lot of the CEOs actually come together and acknowledge that there is something missing in their culture. There is something that's missing such that people who get hired leave very quickly. They, they get to the middle of the company and they stall. And by, through this community of practice, we're gonna be able to share best practices and ideas for how we can deal with that problem. Uh, that's a huge issue for all these companies, including my own company, which has a lot of people in senior management, but a lot of people stall in the middle of the company. We did a lot better over the last few years with women because we got very intentional about putting women in operating jobs. And you know, lo and behold, when we put a woman in a senior operating job, lo and behold, all these other terrific women who could do operating jobs came up underneath them. And I think we have to be very intentional in the same way. So we have to think about promoting people who are in the company. Uh, and I also think coming back to the basic thing, companies like Merck have to think very carefully about re-credentialing certain roles within our company that don't actually require uh, degrees. Which is partly why uh, you've know, you you've, you've set this up as a 10-year mission, right? And it's, it's a 10-year mission, not, not just to 
hire a million jobs. It's to retain, advance, yes. and have all the companies get better. And this uh, is about uh, careers, not just entry level jobs. And and uh, you know one other thing that's come up in the last year, there's been such a uh, an outpouring of wanting to do something yesterday. <laughs> Yes. and respond to the challenges. I, I see this in, in other similar issues. Uh, you know, Asian American hate, for example, is on the rise. And uh, but you you have the you have the conviction here that you know this is these are not issues that will be solved in a, in a quick hit. Um, but you're starting a new company with a ten year goal. Um, is that uh, is that hard to uh, to resist the urge to do something very fast and? Not for me, because I think that when people say that they can solve complex issues quickly and overnight, often I see that as a cop out. These are complex issues for a reason. And I think what we're going to do, and this is where the community of practice comes in, together we're going to learn how to do this. This is a population that needs a lot of support. These are people who have been excluded from the mainstream of society, for example, excluded from the educational mainstream. And so we're going to have to make sure that we figure out how to provide the right kind of wraparound services and support to allow those people to be successful, mm -hmm. not only to start being employed, but also to go through this whole process and, and find fulfilling careers. Ken, this issue has been around for a long, long time. Um, why do you think we needed to create this, this new sort of innovative insurgent concept like the 110. Uh, why, why hasn't this been solved <laughs> sooner? Um, well, I think in our society, we, we tend to look at these problems when, when we see an acute situation like we saw after the death of, of George Floyd, people protesting in the streets. And then we go back to the things that we know how to do. So there's nothing harder to change than the status quo because the status quo has a very strong pull on how people operate their companies, how they live their lives. And I think we needed an organization like 110 to come in and challenge, again, all of those orthodoxies, all of those norms. And we had to bring an organization that will bring the kind of ingenuity and creativity that's gonna be required to do this at scale. And I think, again, one of the great things we have is all these companies are saying, if we bring these people in, we will hire them. We will look at our job credentials and we will bring these people in. So I think it's not something that's going to change overnight. Uh, everybody likes to have a quick fix in our society. But listen, the problems having to do with race-based barriers are more than 400 years old in this country. Yeah. And, you know, for example, you know, one of the issues that I care passionately about are the educational disparities that exist for Black children. But let's be really clear, those things can be fixed in certain schools, but we have a challenge fixing them at scale. You know, my wife and I run a school in, in West Philadelphia that does, we think a really great job with about 200 kids, but that's a drop in a bucket compared to the number of kids who go to public school in Philadelphia. So we're gonna to have to take our time, study the issue, but at the same time have some urgency about hiring people soon, because at the end of the day, we can make a difference in a lot of people's lives tomorrow. Well, uh, we're excited to be a part of this uh, journey with you, Ken. I know you've hired a, a great CEO, uh, Maurice, uh, to get started. And uh, between uh, the organizations you can scale up and the, uh, the companies who are willing to hire. Um, Manny, we couldn't have gotten this off the ground without the support of Bain, your, co your colleague Maria and, and all her colleagues have made it possible for us to even get to the point where we could hire our first CEO, Maurice Jones, who's just from Central Casting for this job. By the way, anybody who's listening who wants to learn about 110, please let us know because we can use all the help we can get uh, in making this change in terms of how we hire and, and promote people. Yeah, so it's on uh, 110.org. Um, lots of, uh, lots of uh, information on it. This organization is just getting going. Right? Maurice just started this week. Um, and by the way, I didn't mention earlier, if anyone uh, has Q&A, please uh, throw it in. We'll do our best at the end. Uh, perhaps let's switch gears a little bit and we'll come back to 110 later. Uh, uh, Ken, well, you, you do have a day job, at least yeah. for a few more months, chairman and chief executive of one of the world's great pharma companies. And uh, pharma and vaccines are top of mind for everyone in our world at the moment. So maybe I'll start with sort of a fair question. You know, we hear 
names like Pfizer and Moderna and AstraZeneca, a company that arguably is the best vaccine manufacturer in the world, you don't hear Merck that much. Um, why, 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 why is that? Well, let me start by saying, I think one of the things that this vaccine has done is it's repeatedly challenged all organizations to think differently about how they conduct their businesses. And for Merck specifically, it's led us to really embrace not just our sense of purpose, but actually ask us to think creatively about how we can deploy our considerable expertise in vaccines and infectious disease to help ease the pandemic. And so while we were not successful with our vaccines, you might've heard that we recently announced a collaboration with J&J &J to bring to bear our manufacturing expertise uh, because we believe, for example, in our Durham plant, we can manufacture up to a billion doses per year of the J&J &J vaccine. So that's an important part. But coming back to what you're asking uh, fundamentally, I think as we look back on what's happened in our response to the pandemic, I think what we see is that a number, again, just like we talked about in 110, the kinds of orthodoxies that existed. Here, a number of the historical norms and rules of vaccine development have been shattered and bringing forth a series of truly remarkable interventions. So the previous record from start to finish of a vaccine program had been four years. It was Merck's mumps vaccine that was considered lightning quick. But in the course of the current pandemic, we've seen two vaccines receive broad emergency use authorizations in under one year. And both of those were discovered by what you might call insurgent organizations, BioNTech in one case and Moderna, that leveraged new technological approaches that already had a known potential benefit of speed, but had never been validated by regulators for human use prior to the pandemic. So those organizations, you could argue, were not encumbered by the historical approaches or orthodoxies of vaccine development and in conjunction with public health authorities, governments and regulators, they were able to create a whole new paradigm for vaccine development that benefited from the unique environment that we had in the pandemic, including the fact that the underlying risk benefit equation of a pandemic is fundamentally different than for traditional sure. diseases. So you might say in summary that for many of us who've been in this business, because you're giving the vaccine to millions of healthy people, we saw speed as the enemy of safety. And what I think has happened in this situation is that we've been able to see these new companies bring forward new vaccines in under a year without cutting any corners whatsoever when it comes to safety. And I think that's actually a fundamentally different approach that they had to bring things in a compressed development process, again, without sacrificing patient safety. So let me, let me say another way, is it, it's, a, it's, it's an example of, you know, when organizations have been around for a long time, they have to ask themselves, what's the difference between process and substance? And often what we do by way of safety and quality is we put in place a lot of process to ensure that we get those outcomes. And these folks came in and said, so for example, there's no need to do each of these steps in order. We can compress the time by doing things at the same time. Yeah, we have a we have a concept that uh, Bain, uh, Ken, you're familiar with. You know, we call it it's founders mentality. And if you can right. scale the founding company, become a scale insurgent, right. as opposed to a slow incumbent, that's the sweet spot. And right. uh, and that's arguably happened here. Now you're you're trying to do that in 110. Start as the uh, the founding uh, founding insurgent. Uh, as you think about Merck in the future, as you, uh, you how how do you take a company with th that that philosophy, that orthodoxy, and say, you know, next next time around, can can we be the insurgent again? Well, uh, you know, it's interesting because our most successful area is in cancer, and in some ways, with Keytruda, we were the insurgent uh, in that instance. We yeah. had nothing in the cancer field, no incumbency at all. So we were able to think about, for example, the number of combinations with Keytruda and other products. We were free to pick any product, and so. We were able to be successful as the insurgent in that situation, but in this situation, 
we were not successful in this, we were not successful so far in vaccines. I should make the point that Merck still has programs that are going in terms of antiviral treatments. And as we see more and more variants, it looks like those kinds of antiviral treatments that we have for things like hepatitis or HIV are going to be important. So what I would say is that, you know, companies that understand how to do things and are successful in a certain way, uh, it's very hard for them, but it's necessary for them to break the paradigm and say, what lessons can we learn from this situation uh, that are not simply based on an element of chance? Because we had great conviction on the approaches that we took, the platforms that we use, for example, uh, with Ebola, which was the, the last pandemic before COVID, yeah. our platforms, which are uh, you know, replicating virus platforms, we were the only ones that were able to get a successful vaccine for Ebola. So that sort of reinforced that we were doing things the right way, but in come other insurgents in this instance. And unfortunately, when we compared the work that we were doing with the first generation COVID vaccines, those, those vaccines just looked a lot better. I remember at the beginning, you, you probably were the, uh, the betting favorite to, to advance the fastest here because of the success with, with Ebola. Yeah. So you mentioned uh, something earlier, which, which I, I thought was, was also quite interesting. Uh, you announced that you'll actually deploy some of your manufacturing capacity um, to, uh, to, to a manufacturer J&J's vaccine. Mm -hmm. uh, typically, you know, helping or getting into league with a competitor, and I know how competitive pharma companies are with each other, would not be a traditional move. Uh, but uh, was that was that an easy choice? Was that an obvious choice? How did that come about? Well, in, in many ways, it was an easy choice because essentially this pandemic requires us to put people first, and there were so many lives at stake. Uh, obviously, inside Merck, we were disappointed that our research efforts did not lead to the kinds of vaccines that we had hoped for. But the fact of the matter is that we had built some manufacturing capacity for our vaccines. And once it was clear that we weren't going to proceed with our vaccines, then the question became whether or not we wanted to, to deploy those capabilities, those resources, that expertise to support one of the approved technology versus continuing to pursue another effort on our part. And time is of the essence. People are dying every day, as you know. And so yeah. for us, it made us reach the conclusion that playing a supportive role in this instance was the thing that we could do. And the industry has done that in the past. I mean, you know, going back to World War II, all the companies made penicillin uh, because the army needed penicillin. Uh, and that's what I think is happening in this instance for Merck we're very proud to be supporting our colleagues at J&J &J, uh, because this is what's going to be good for humanity. Uh, you know, this pandemic, we, we Americans tend to be focused on when are we going to get it into every American's arm? And, you know, President Biden has promised by the end of May. But let's remember, this is a worldwide pandemic. Yeah. There are seven and a half billion of us sharing this small space we call Earth. And none of us are going to be safe until all of us are safe. So you know, how many vaccines do we have to make in order to vaccinate the world to try to keep this under control? And we already see that in some of the low income countries that haven't had exposure to the vaccines, maybe five to 10% in South Africa or five to 10% in Brazil, we're getting these variants yeah. uh, that actually are gonna create a problem. And we don't wanna be in a situation where we're sort of doing whack-a-mole with every new vaccine and there's another variant around the corner. Well, you know, I, I just, uh, I'll speak on behalf of seven and a half billion, probably not my place, but, uh, but as uh, someone who's waiting for my vaccine, also my, my, home, my home country, the Philippines, is one of the countries that doesn't have any kind of vaccine plan or supply yet, or really um, getting as much supply on the ground and into arms as possible is, uh, is a worthy cause for everyone to uh, uh, band together. So thank you on that, Ken. Now, yeah, you, and I also think it's important because we have continued our work on antiviral platforms. It's important to also have therapeutics. Yes. Uh, it's, it's great to have vaccinated. a vaccine if you can get the vaccine and if it works across all variants, but, but having a broad spectrum oral antiviral for people who are infected already is another important thing. Something that can people, keep people out of the hospital uh, can reduce mortality. That's also our aim. 
and it's it's a, it's, it's a broad portfolio. Thank you. Now, you know, back to connecting uh, one issue. It's not just supply; it's getting past uh, people to actually take it. Oh yeah, absolutely. I know the uh, African American, the Black community is one of the places where there's a a large amount of distrust. And so, for you who uh, who understands that very well, would you like to make a public service announcement? <laughs> Uh, yes. Ken, on, the, on that topic. Absolutely. So what I would say to everybody within the sound of my voice is that these vaccines, while they have been developed at hyperspeed compared to the past, there have been no shortcuts at all with respect to regulatory science, with respect to the safety and quality of these vaccines. And it's really important for people, although it's easy for me to say, it's really important in this instance to have trust. You know, when I think about what the industry has produced here, beyond the obvious benefits of the actual vaccines and therapies, one of the things that I hope is an outcome of this is that we as a society begin to think differently about science, and we begin to think differently about R&D, and we begin to trust science a little bit more. Uh, because, you know, frankly, we've been in some ways talking out of both sides of our mouths. And I don't wanna be overly political, but, but we have a new administration. The past administration was interesting because it had sort of a bifurcation of a view on science. On the one hand, there was a lot of skepticism towards the CDC and mask wearing and all those conventions. On the other hand, you gotta give that administration credit for doing Operation Warp Speed and getting these vaccines up and running very quickly. So one of the things that I hope happens, not just in the black community, but in many communities is that we can win back the trust of people uh, you know, who get their information from social media, who hear all of these falsehoods that actually are counterproductive to public health. Well, thank you. And uh, I'll, I'll speak, I, I'll, when it's my turn, <laughs> I'll be, I'll, be, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll be right there. I don't know when that is. I, I did see President Biden said by, by May here in the Bay Area. I'm, that is, I'm quite, that is quite an endeavor to have that many vaccines by the end of May. <laughs> well, so, we want to uh, try to help. <laughs> thank you. So maybe let's, uh, we're, we're sort of working uh, your career backwards here a little bit, Ken. Let's have a third conversation about your own journey. You know, you, we've heard about uh, this, um, this uh, visionary leader uh, launching an insurgent organization like 110, um, you know, the, uh, and then the chairman, chief executive of Merck, who's very thoughtful, um, you know, self-critical when it's appropriate, but, you know, you've done um, amazing things and, and teaming for the greater good. So uh, perhaps uh, your own history on how you got to where you are, Ken, you've described, you have two careers. You were a lawyer. Yes. And then you became a pharma executive. Um, and before that, you know, you're a, you're a kid from Philly. Yeah. So uh, would, you, uh, would you like to share uh, how, how, how did you get to this point? You know, the Ken Fraser that we're talking about who's uh, so uh, multifaceted and thoughtful and all these stuff. Let me start by saying that I've been given extraordinary opportunities at every stage of my life that others didn't have. I'm, I'm, the older I get, Manny, the more I'm sort of struck by what I think of as the random lottery of birth. Uh, so I came along at a time, I'm the eighth of my father's nine children, my younger sister and I came along at a time when the social engineers in Philadelphia were engaged in an experiment that they called school desegregation. So being born in the inner city, my younger sister and I were put on buses and sent to better schools. It happened to be almost all white schools, and I got a, a much more rigorous education as a result of that. Uh, I eventually graduated law school, went to Harvard Law School, graduated and came and started practicing law in Philadelphia in a very venerable old firm uh, where I was only the second black lawyer in their history. But the fact of the matter is I was able to be mentored. And that was a very important part of what happened to me as a young lawyer, because uh, a lot of what's important in terms of becoming an effective lawyer, in my case, a jury trial lawyer, is to apprentice under a really terrific lawyer. And so when it came time for me to try cases to the jury, I knew exactly what to do because I just had to imitate the successful person that I had watched do that over and over again. And then, uh, you know, I, I did a lot of cases for Merck. We, we won a lot of good verdicts and I came to the attention of the company and the CEO. And, uh, you know, in 1992, at the time we were having healthcare reform, which was then called Hillary Care. 
uh, in short. That, that then CEO, a great CEO named Roy Vagelos, oh, uh, yeah. called me and asked me to come have tea with him one afternoon. And it was tea on China, I have to say. Uh, and between sips of those China cups, he turned to me and said, we're struggling to get our point of view across when the, we're being attacked by the administration. He said, you talk good, so why don't you come in and, <laughs> and become my chief of communications? And so I talk a little bit about what I call the opportunity gap by being given a rigorous education. I was able to overcome that opportunity gap. But using Merck as an example, I also overcame what's often called the access gap. So I went to work as a 38 year old vice president working for Roy Vagelos, who was a superstar CEO. I, among other things, I was his chief communicator. So as he wanted to express what he wanted to say internally or externally, it was my job to put in those things into words. There were no iPhones in those days, Manny. So I would spend hours with Roy Vagelos listening to how he thought. And so now I find myself in his chair several successors removed. And on my best day, I'm simply imitating him again. So all my life, I had the mentorship and importantly, the sponsorship of people who were in a position to make or break my career. And that's you know, unusual, I think, for a minority person in my position. Well, yeah, uh, we, we're huge believers, Ken, as you know, uh, our own firm is an apprenticeship model. Uh, management consultancy and law firms, you know, sh share that, right? It's yes. professional services and the importance of a mentor, a sponsor, you know, a role model uh, helps. It, and sometimes it is as easy as you do what the mentors show you how to do. Now, how important is it? As you said, you, you went to a mostly white school that was, high, was better. You went to a law firm that I presume was mostly white. Uh, was the first black vice president at Merck. So yeah, I'm sort of so, used to that. <laughs> So you, 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 had to, uh, you had to have mentor. How important is it? This, this comes up a lot in our discussions with our, with our own diversity. How important is it to have a mentor who looks like you? Very important. Or, because or someone who isn't. Yeah. Very, very important. And, and when I was both in the private practice of law and when I was here, there were people who understood the challenges that were associated with being a black person, trying to make partner in the law firm or trying to make it up the corporate ladder here who could actually help me understand what I call some of the invisible rules of engagement that exist in the law firm or in, exist inside the, the company. And those people were different kinds of mentors. Uh, on, you know, we talked about soft skills and hard skills. Uh, for me as a black lawyer, for example, trying to develop my own book of business, I had to learn from those lawyers who were black and who were successful what does it take to develop trust and confidence with a clientele that's almost all white? And sometimes I make people angry by saying, in essence, what I learned was to be user friendly for my white clientele. And that wasn't very easy in the early days as I was a young, angry person. But as I went through and got mentored, this is an example of being mentored by black lawyers. They helped yeah. me understand the importance of being able to overcome, frankly, the the societal expectations that African-American lawyers face in order to be successful. I'm, what I'm trying to say is that I belong to a group that was not presumptively an insider. And so yeah. I had to work hard to become an insider. And you had to find mentors, I presume. Uh, you had mentors in your firm, but uh, to find a, a, a black lawyer mentor, you could you could cross firms. And for the, the community bonds across what might be competitive firms become very important here, right? Yeah, I was very fortunate. My main mentor, people who don't know the law won't know his name, but he was Bill Coleman. He was once President Ford's Secretary of Transportation. He was first in his law school class in 1943 at Harvard Law School and was the author of the Brown versus Board of Education brief. He was not in my firm, but he knew of me and he was a very strict taskmaster and held me up to high standards and actually is very much responsible. He's one of those people I still imitate when I'm in an important conversation in a boardroom. I'm still imitating. Another one of those mentors just died this week, Vernon Jordan. Oh, Vernon Jordan, yes. Yeah, my condolences, yeah, he was, uh, he was an amazing man. And, and even when you get into uh, um, Mercan, we find uh, diversity, inclusion, and conscious bias for a lawyer communicator to become the head of a pharma company, 
regardless of your color, you know, absolutely. You, you ain't a PhD scientist. That's right. So uh, that, that, that must be hard. That must have been hard too. <laughs> yeah. So again, I was very fortunate because I came to the company as a lawyer and within one year, Roy Vagelo said, you cannot be in the legal department. I'm making you go into the business. And I remember saying to him, I'm uncomfortable with that. I'd like to contribute to the company in my own discipline. And he said, that's the most ridiculous thing I ever heard. You really need to get into the core of our business. And so I've been at the company now 29 years. People still think of me as a lawyer, uh, but I've only been in the legal department eight of those 29 years. Uh, so I was given an opportunity to be broad. You know, it's important to have depth. Everybody has to have a certain amount of depth in some discipline. But I find in a, a company like Merck, uh, we're sometimes victim of, victims of specialized knowledge. And for those people who are able to integrate, that's a very valuable thing. So having moved from one area of the company to another, I find that I have a role of translating or integrating between the highly specialized silos of the company. Well, so let's uh, maybe uh, as, we, as we close, I'd, I'd love to chat about what's next. You know, you've had a great career as a lawyer, I guess, uh, you know, a dozen years or so, and a great career as a, as a Merck executive for almost 30 years. You've announced uh, you're retiring as chairman and CEO uh, later this year in June, I believe, in a few months. And, uh, and somewhere along the way, you also became a visionary, you know, insurgent founder of an organization, which by definition is even its title, has a 10 year mission at least. I, um, what, uh, so what, what comes next? I presume a 110 is a part of it, but, uh, and you mentioned uh, your wife, Andrea, uh, later, I presume who's going to guide you in this journey. What, what happens next, Mr. Fraser? Well, I will say, first of all, 110 will be a very important part of whatever I do going out of here because it's just a part of me. And I think we have an opportunity to make a very big difference in the world for a lot of people. I'm not sure what I'm going to do next. I've been so focused on Merck that I think I need to pause and reflect and take some time. I've been very fortunate to get lots of different offers from lots of different places. I will say that what I'm inclined to focus on, though, Manny, is this issue around the importance of education. Uh, I, I have to say, often I feel like an imposter in the sense that I ask myself, where would I be had I not been the one picked out and put on the bus and been given a rigorous education? And we live in a country where many children don't get that opportunity. And many children, frankly, don't come from a household like mine where education was so valued. So the question becomes, we know how we can take these young kids who are disadvantaged in small numbers and change their lives. How can we start to think about making those kinds of changes at scale? I think that's a very important issue going forward, and I hope to make some contribution to a very complex issue. Well, uh, I, for one, will uh, be excited. It's been a privilege for us to be part of this uh, journey. You know, we didn't really know each other very uh, at all, and before this uh, started, and uh, you've immediately become uh, a role model, uh, a mentor, whether you know it or not, or like it or not. Well, we mentor each other, man. That's for sure. <laughs> Well, that, you know, the best mentorship relationships are two ways. I, exactly. I just uh, talked with an old friend, John Donahoe, last night, and, and that was, a, that was a, who you know as well. Yes. Um, and that was a big theme. It, it's always a two-way street. And uh, so I, I, wish you, I wish you the very best. We'll do everything we can to help this organization be successful, not just now, but for the next decade. And on behalf of everyone here, uh, you know, and, uh, and everyone in the country actually can. Thank you. Thank and you. Wish one, and the very best. Thank you. Good seeing you. Good seeing you, and uh, we'll uh, we'll uh, finish the uh, session here. Thank you, everybody, for attending. And any questions, please go to 110.org. Thank you. Bye bye.